some of them are uh, smiling, you know, they're quite proud. Hey, you know, I'm, I made it through training. I am in the U.S. Army Air Force. And they were the rock stars yeah. of the 1940s, quite frankly. It's a, a 21st century way of uh, thinking of these guys and, and how they viewed themselves. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. The 390th Memorial Museum is a museum within a museum at the Pima Air and Space Museum. It is a museum dedicated to the memory and service of the men of the 390th Bomb Group that flew their missions in the 8th Air Force out of RAF Framlingham in Suffolk. It is a remarkable museum and one that I was profoundly moved in. And we're going to get into that a bit with the museum's executive director, Bill Buckingham. When I was at the Pima Air and Space Museum back in February, Bill was kind enough to spend an hour or so with me to discuss how the museum came about and also talk about the men of the 390th and what it means to him to be able to tell their story to all the visitors who come and visit, not just the incredibly beautifully restored B-17 that they have, but also the incredible photographs and jackets from the men of the 390th. So, first question to Bill, how did the museum come about? So during World War II, uh, especially during the first several years of the war, there was no way to take the fight directly to Hitler except mm-hmm. through the skies. And once uh, America entered the war and uh, started building uh, aircraft and training crews and uh, started uh, shipping over to England and using that beautiful island as a, a very stable aircraft carrier to strike at Nazi Germany and its uh, web of um, units across all of Western Europe. The uh, 390th was a bomb group within what was called the U.S. 8th Air Force, which was a unit of the American Air F- Army Air Force, specifically designed to bomb military targets in Europe. And the 390th was comprised of about 3,000 individuals. Uh, it, uh, it consisted of pilots and co-pilots and others on the aircraft and thousands of men and a few women on the ground that it did everything from issuing paychecks and making sure the mail got delivered to repairing the aircraft, arming the aircraft, loading safely loading uh, bombs on the aircraft, cooking for the uh, the ground crews and the air crews, et cetera. It's basically a, a whole lot of Small village, a uh, small city, really uh, had the equivalent of a police department, had a hospital. So you had everything that you would see, had, had religious uh, services, so had chaplains, rabbis, uh, everything you would see in a small, self-sufficient city comprised the 390th bomb group. And they were part of a, a much larger organization dedicated to taking the war to Hitler and its cronies out of England. Of course, uh, post uh, victory, we, the Allies win the war in Europe. Everyone's eager to return to civilian life. So in the 1970s, the former commanding officer of this bomb group. Before we jump forward, yeah. where were they based? A tiny little uh, area, East Anglia, East England, uh, Framlingham. A little village, had a church, had a pub, had a few houses and a railroad going through it and one small road. And then uh, a whopping great airbase. <laughs> and, and this enormous airbase. The population of the airbase greatly outnumbered the population of the village, probably by certainly 50 to 1, maybe 100 to 1, <laughs> some, something on that scale. Uh, former farmland, former RAF base, uh, turned over to the Americans to launch airstrikes against the Nazi regime. So uh, it, the commanding officer, uh, Colonel Joe Muller, must have made one heck of an impression on the men at that base, the flight crews and the ground crews, because in the late 70s, he starts uh, developing this concept of building some kind of a memorial to those who served in the 390th and, of course, 
uh, those who were lost during their service in the 390th. So he starts calling men and women who were ordered to potentially die mm -hmm. at his command uh, that are scattered across the United States. And rather than hanging up on them, I think something that many vets would have done, they took his call and ultimately were recruited into this effort to build some kind of a memorial. And the idea of the memorial kind of grew, expanded into the idea of a memorial museum, some sort of a museum. Uh, originally located on Davis Monthan okay. Air Base. Um, so not the most publicly accessible mm -hmm. memorial. So Mueller uh, approached uh, the great uh, Pima Air and Space Museum and worked out an arrangement where we could build our own separate museum on Pima Air and Space Museum grounds, uh, our own separate nonprofit, own separate governance mm -hmm. and fundraising and whatnot, and uh, secured that arrangement and went to the Air Force and they were able to secure a B-17 that was in service as a firefighting aircraft at the time on loan to the Forest Service. So the so Colonel Mueller goes to the Air Force, the Air Force goes back to uh, uh, the Forest Service and says, want our aircraft back. So plane arrive, flies into Davis Monthan and is rolled across the street. And these veterans begin this campaign of scouring the United States and, and perhaps further afield to secure all the parts and pieces to equip the bomber as it would have been during World War II because all of that stuff had been stripped off. Uh, its purpose was to dump fire retardant on burning forests. Uh, so bomb racks, machine guns, sights, uh, the radio equipment, navigational equipment, every all the, the turrets, the fixtures that you would have seen uh, in England uh, at the 390th base, long since gone, everything. Mm -hmm. um, and paint it and clean it up and equip it just like you would have seen on its base in England, which in itself was an amazing undertaking, but they went above and beyond that. They continued to reach out to 390th ground crew and air crew veterans who began donating everything from love letters written to and from their spouses and or girlfriends back uh, in the States or in England to diaries, photographs, flight gear, um, flight suits, flight jackets, gloves, hats, uh, uh, ties, shirts, er shoelaces, um, radios, everything, flare guns, uh, everything that they had kind of packed away in their closets uh, as they went about their civilian lives, putting the war behind them for trying to for forget uh, the, the heinous things that they witnessed or experienced and started building up a really impressive collection of flight tower logs. Mm -hmm. We have tens of thousands of pages of documents from the base, from the, the control tower, from the headquarters. We know the crew assignments, what day they flew, what they were carrying, who flew uh, in each individual plane, the success or failures over the target, the losses, et cetera, uh, transfers, who, who got paid what, uh, you name it. We've got this incredibly detailed history of the 390th preserved in artifacts and documents and photographs, as well as in the form of the aircraft and, and other artifacts that are on display. So it's an incredibly granular amount of detail you have about the life of the base. Yes, absolutely. It's a very personalized exploration. Matter of fact, one of the things we have uh, that we were talking about earlier, we have hundreds of crew photos. The crew photos are photos of generally all 10 of the flight crew posing oftentimes in front of their personalized aircraft or maybe an aircraft that they flew just during training. But they were trained as a unit, went over as a unit, and more often than not flew as a cohesive unit of 10 guys whose ultimate uh, authority rested in the pilot. His responsibility for, was for those other nine lives, co-pilot, navigator, bombardier, the gunners, uh, and so forth. So we have these photos of faces looking back at you here in 
the 21st century of very young guys, many of them scared but hiding it well, uh, scared to death, posing as a group before their, their flights. And about two thirds of those guys were either killed or shot down and became prisoner, may have died as uh, a prisoner of war. Looking back at you, some of the crew photos have their, their dogs. And one crew photo, if you look very carefully, column 28 uh, in this uh, mural exhibit shows the baby bear that went over uh, from the United <laughs> States with this bomb group. The flight engineer made a specialized oxygen mask for the bear so he could survive the high altitude flight across the Atlantic. Uh, he didn't go up on many missions. He stayed on the ground most of the time. But you, you see these guys proudly uh, posing with their pet bear. Uh, <laughs> I mean, this is a, this is a, a uh, museum that's about hardware mm -hmm. so much as it is about the people, their experiences with life and death, uh, their, their, their service, their time in England. For the flight crews, that time was limited. Maybe they go up on one mission, get shot down. Their time has ended. Maybe they, they fly all require 25, 30, 35 missions. They rotate back to a safer, uh, safer duty elsewhere. But the guys who had to patch them up or bury them, the guys who had to remove the remains from the aircraft, and turn that aircraft around, repair its battle damage so it could go up perhaps the very next day. They were stuck there for the duration. So they so served the, and suffered in a very different kind of way. So the, the, the ground crews didn't have a, a specified tour. They, they were assigned to the base and yes. they were there. Oh, right. okay. Indeed. My dad was a uh, ground crew in uh, the 6th Air Force in Panama. His brother was 8th Air Force. He was crew chief uh, in England. Not with the 390th, but... Uh, so I grew up hearing these stories, seeing the photos. So these guys suffered in a different way than the flight crew, but they, they paid a price nevertheless. And that's what we present. We present these stories of life on the base, service and sacrifice. Uh, yes, we are focused on the 390th bomb group, but the experiences of these young kids at all the other bases was incredibly similar. So it's also a window onto a much broader story that we also tell. The, using the 390th to tell the, the eighth story. Really. Exactly. And you mentioned the photographs. I, if, if I'm honest, I walked up to the upper level to have a better look at the aircraft, which is stunning. I didn't spend much time looking at the aircraft. It's incredibly moving. It's very well done. Um, it's, it, it, it gets a bit overwhelming. Because there's so many young faces looking back at you, yeah. and it's yeah. I, I sort of went up from the the backside and walked away round where you've got the jackets and things, mm -hmm. and it's yeah. It, it's it's so well done. You you don't look at the the beautiful beautiful shiny B seventeen that's on on the ground floor, right. and it's yeah. It, it's it's incredibly moving. So <clears> it's <throat> it has the desired effect, or it certainly did on me. So, I, I have um been director since uh, last July and I am um, I still tear up mm -hmm. if I spend much time looking at uh, these photos it's it's interesting to uh, to look some of them are uh, smiling mm -hmm. you know they're quite proud hey you know I'm I made it through training I am in the US Army Air Force and they were the rock stars mm -hmm. of the 1940s quite frankly is a a 21st century way of uh, thinking of these guys and, and how they viewed themselves. Uh, and, and of course, being in their late teens or very early 20s, the, the notion of death um, you're and more, mortality. You're that, aren't you? yeah. yeah, you're invincible. And even uh, after they got to their base and flew their first mission or saw others coming back from their mission, it, 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 in their minds, it's always the other guy. Yeah. He's going to go down in a fireball, not me. And of course, uh, two thirds, of, as I mentioned, two thirds of those faces staring back from that epoch in time 
at looking at you today uh, were e either killed, wounded, or in prison. Uh, only uh, about a third came home relatively unscathed, physically relatively unscathed. Of course, psychologically and emotionally, they paid a, a huge toll because this was carnage on a scale unimaginable to kids growing up in the United States, maybe from small towns or farms during the Great Depression. Nothing could prepare them for what they would see or, or personally experience um, once they got to England and participate in the, the greatest air war ever. And hopefully there will never be um, something on that scale again. Good, good to sell it. Let's hope not. What, what is, you, you, you've, you've been in post for, for a while now. What's the sort of general feeling to it? Because the, the, the eighth sort of lives large, doesn't it? it does. if, even now. Um, you know, I, I spend, I, I, I'm a B25 guy. I, you know, so, you know, the 14th. And, and the, those, those guys over there kind of, when you research them, read them, the eighth is, you know, they're, they're stealing, stealing focus a lot of the time. Sure. But why, why does the eighth stay in our, our view so much now? It, sure. Very good questions. Um, part of it comes down to uh, where American reporters were stationed. Uh, they, many of them, were stationed at or near uh, Eighth Air Force bases. So you had the cameras, you had the reporters, you had the correspondents telling the stories repeatedly back uh, back home on the radio and the newspapers and the, mag the, the periodic magazines at the time. Of course, there were, there were no television stations uh, during this period of time. So they got the coverage, mm -hmm. uh, and that echoed down through time. But it, it goes beyond just where the reporters were stationed. That, that's, I think, part of it. Part of it was they were a very, very large outfit that from their creation, uh, starting with a half a dozen guys, uh, by midpoint of the war, had swelled to an organization over 200,000. 200,000, and they were a, a functioning organization. If you imagine trying to form, let's say, a, a restaurant chain from six people to 200,000 people with that kind of global reach and complex machinery and stuff in a matter of, a, some number of months. It, it, it's hard to conceive uh, here in the 21st century of anything like that, and, and yet they did that. So logistically, organizationally, management-wise, leadership-wise, there were thousands of miracles involved in, and lots of hard work in just simply creating it and making it work, yet alone going from peacetime and making it work in a horrific combat environment where everything was trying to kill you, not just the Germans, Mother Nature was trying to kill these guys because they were going up in aircraft, hastily designed, hastily built, that uh, were flying at six miles above the surface of the earth, 50 to 60 below zero. I mean, the, the first generation of B-17s over there didn't even have window glass in the radio and waste compartment. So you had 120 to 160 mile an hour winds cutting through the aircraft, which was unpressurized, unheated. Other than a small number of pilots today, most people listening to the broadcast have never experienced flight in this kind of manner where you have to have multiple layers of clothing on you or you will freeze yeah. in a few a very small number of minutes in an unpressurized aircraft where if you take your oxygen mass off for a small number of minutes you will go unconscious a few minutes beyond that you are brain dead so the environment was trying to kill these young kids as well as the germans uh, the clouds the fog you know these guys trained in the united states where mostly in clear, sunny western states, <laughs> right? The English environment much of the year was very, very, very different than what they trained in here in the United States. The weather's still trying to kill us. Actually. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and the technique, the, the, 
the model of operating was hazardous as well, trying to take initially a few hundred and then later in the war a few thousand aircraft from dispersed bases all over eastern England to go up to their assigned altitude, 30,000 feet, and to maneuver into assigned positions flying essentially wingtip to wingtip uh, in the fog, in the sleet, in the snow, in the rain, and everything else, all the other joyous aspects of the, of the English flying weather, uh, and just, just getting into formation was an extremely hazardous uh, undertaking that many didn't survive. Uh, Mid-air collisions, others never found their assigned formation, went off into the muck, ran out of fuel somewhere over the Atlantic, never seen or heard from again. So every aspect of what they were undertaking was extremely hazardous to their health and their, their, their longevity. So the, the dramatic story that I just described, all of these elements working against them, and yet these, these thousands of young kids persevered. They went on their missions. They, they fought their way through the German fighters, the German cannons on the ground. They were never turned back by anything other than Mother, mother Nature. They would sometimes get recall uh, orders after having fought their way through the initial defenses of the Third Reich, get a recall order and turn around. But they were never recalled because of the Germans, never. They were recalled, at, if at all, because of Mother Nature not cooperating, usually over the target. Uh, back then, if you couldn't see the target, you couldn't hit it. There, there was radar was in a very primitive state, at least a radar that could be carried on an aircraft. The British, of course, famously used radar to defend the island. Uh, but you had the luxury of really big sets of electronics on the ground. You didn't have to have them small enough to fit into an airplane and light enough for the airplane to take off. So just so many elements um, of the 8th Air Force story to capture the imagination. And unfortunately, part of their notoriety comes from the horrendous casualties that they suffered. You were safer being in the, the U.S. Marines than you were the 8th Air Force, safer than safer in the U.S. Navy, safer being in the U.S. Army than you were in the 8th Air Force. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we are at the Pima Air and Space Museum with some of our Korean War vintage aircraft. Um, here is our F-86E Sabre. Um, which was the preeminent American jet fighter during the Korean conflict. Um, originally, we were flying a lot of straight wing aircraft like the F-84 and you know, reciprocating engine aircraft still like the Mustang, various other aircraft. Um, when this aircraft made its debut, the MiG-15, which was used by the North Koreans um, with also probably some help from other nations. Um, but it was a game changer, swept wings, had a cannon, and really, you know, overpowered anything with a straight wing. Um, around that time, our F-86 started coming into Korea, which the two aircraft were pretty equally matched. Um, armament aside, you know, the uh, F-86 had 50 calibers, while the MiG had, I believe, 20 millimeter cannons, if I recall correctly, three. Um, so 30 millimeter, I think it was 30. Was it 30 millimeter? Two, two, two 30, 220, something, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Cannon. Not the armaments. It, they're cannons versus machine cannons. guns, which yeah. has always been a big argument. You know, the Americans were always full in on the 50 cal and the machine gun side of things. Well, a lot of other nations tended to lean towards cannons, you know, so depends who you ask, which is the better air, aerial weapon. But our F-86 is actually a real combat veteran with the 51st fighter interceptor wing. Um, it's a bit of a Franken airplane. The fuselage did come from the, a Korean War veteran. The wings did come from another aircraft, but that was one of those things where we decided to go with obviously the identity of the fuselage, which you know has the more interesting history and has an actual Korean War combat provenance. 
Um, it could be a little bit of a time too to talk about our curatorial choices with paint schemes. Yes. Usually we always try to paint our aircraft in markings that are historically accurate for that aircraft. This F-86 is an example of this. The markings on the aircraft are based on photographic evidence from the Korean War of this aircraft. Our MiG-15, on the other hand, like most surviving MiGs in a lot of collections, is a Polish MiG. It's not a Korean MiG. But because for this, we decided we wanted to tell the story of the Korean War, so we did paint this aircraft in North Korean markings, where usually we don't do that. Um, we usually always try to paint the aircraft for uh, you know, the historically accurate markings for that aircraft. But like I said, once in a while when we have another story to tell, we'll uh, make an exception. Also, if we painted all our MiGs, they would all be pretty much in Polish markings instead of uh, representing some of the different um, Warsaw Pact nations like we have. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.com. Org. And now, back to the show. Let's get back to the 390th. We, we, we've done the big picture. What, through, through the collation of all of that, you know, first, first-hand prim, primary documentation, what, what, what are some of the stories that have sort of leapt out of you as your, as your time here at the museum that because you know, as as you walk around, there's lots of individual little little notes. There's um, I, I, can't, I can't remember the the navigator's name, but there's the the, the page from his notebook right. as well, which is just bringing a, a really clear human focus yes. on this. Because it, it it can be a little bit overwhelming when you you've got a big airplane. There's all those photos right. and things, but you draw into this. For you, as the boss, what's leapt out at you? Number of things. Um, right now the. Uh, the exhibits on the main level that are in the recessed display cases, those are all temporary exhibits. Uh, the main exhibits ordinarily uh, are there, had to be removed when uh, we suffered uh, significant um, rain damage, water intrusion from the roof a couple summers ago. So we are in a, a rebuilding phase. But prior yes, to yes, that... Yes, listener, it does rain here in Arizona. Oh, it does. <laughs> and... When it does, sometimes it, it's uh, three, four, five inches all in a matter of an hour or two. Uh, so when the skies let loose in Arizona, they really let loose and sometimes comes through a museum roof and does oh, no. exhibit oh. damage. So uh, what you're seeing is a, a small fraction of what's on display, what will be coming back on display. One of the things that touched me is um, the guys carried these little paper pamphlets, uh, maybe three inches across, four inches tall, maybe smaller than that. These were their pay books. They got paid once a month. And we will be returning to exhibit this one officer's pay book. And to see both, even in uh, 1940s terms and certainly in 21st century terms, the uh, $200 a month uh, that an officer uh, going into combat on one of these aircraft would get paid and his little life insurance deduction and how much of it was being uh, withheld by the Depart U.S. Department of War, the War Department, um, and being sent back to his family. And, and the small number of dollars he, he kept for himself there that he had to buy extra uniforms with. Um, if he went off base um, for food or alcohol or, or whatever, um, small number of dollars he, he lived on for such an incredibly hazardous job. And, and he was a, a, a pilot. The, the pay books for the enlisted guys, the gunners, who were in that plane suffering the same hazards as the, the pilot in the cockpit, uh, so much less. For me, that makes it very personal, uh, as well as the, the diaries, the log books you know, uh, from the different stations that we have. Really, when you see it in their own handwriting, uh, letters home, letters from home, the kinds of things that they thought of or worried about uh, are, are the things that we worry about today. Uh, but amplified by 
the loneliness, the isolation, even though they were in a base uh, of uh, 3,000 men and a few women, they were still so isolated in many ways, um, physically, emotionally. They were ultimately with strangers. They weren't with their family. They weren't with people they grew up with. Uh, so there was a, a sense of isolation even in a crowded uh, officer's club or NCO club might be packed shoulder to shoulder on a, a, a day where a mission was scrubbed so they could mm -hmm. consume beer and whatever else uh, could be made available uh, on base or off base. They were still very alone in many ways, still missing home. After all, many of these guys were, were teenagers. Uh, it's phenomenal the number of guys who forged their papers or uh, or faked the signatures to get into the war because they were too young to be accepted mm -hmm. by the War Department. This was an, an a, a endeavor, an American endeavor, that these young kids were trying really hard to get into. They wanted to be part of the Army Air Forces. Uh, they, they wanted to defend democracy, demand to uh, defend freedom, to take the fight to this uh, Austrian corporal uh, in Berlin. Just uh, so different a f phenomenon than what I grew up observing. Uh, yeah, disclaimer of my age, I grew up uh, watching the Vietnam conflict uh, unfold and collapse to watch uh, individuals trying to avoid service in that conflict. So that was my generational experience. So looking back with that experience to an epic in time where people wanted to get involved, mm -hmm. wanted to serve, wanted to take the fight to Hitler, also is quite moving for me. What, what sort of reaction do you have? Because I, I spent a bit of time as they wandering around yesterday having a look. And, I like watching other people in museums and seeing how they they interact with the space, how they interact with the, with the exhibits. Um, it, it was noticeable that, as I was saying, it's, it's, it's very moving and a couple of people had the same idea as me, oh, let's go up and have another look. And I heard them coming up the stairs having that conversation and then again they were, they were drawn in, into the photographs. What's the sort of reaction people have as they, they go through the museum? Because this is quite an overwhelming place at the best time. There's a lot of aircraft. There's a lot to see. Yes. But the 3-9th Museum <clears throat> is very intimate. What, what sort of reactions do you see from the people that come through the door? Uh, uh, the uh, tech heads, uh, the, the guys and the gals that come in who are interested in the machinery mm -hmm. will stand and have... Uh, all sorts of detailed conversations with my staff and my volunteers, my docents. Um, and so there's that crowd. But there's a very large crowd of people who come into our museum, perhaps even by accident, mm -hmm. didn't know we were here at Pima Air and Space Museum. Come in, not really sure what we're about, get a, maybe a two-minute intro by my docents in the lobby and start exploring. The uh, many, many people look at the airplane, uh, stick their head in um, the various uh, hatches that are open, and the plane is well lit, so you can see uh, what turns out to be a pretty confined space for a plane that looks so big on the outside. It's a lot smaller than they show in the movies. You betcha. <laughs> this is a, especially in the, the forward half of the airplane, uh, that nose, you, you were. You, you got around on your belly um, to go from the nose to the flight deck, for example, and trying to squeeze to the Bombay um, in the center of the plane was also a very tight fit. So it, it's a tight space, and people wonder about that. But what's really interesting to watch are when people encounter the flight jackets. This is not just the uniform. This is a piece of leather clothing that a very young guy, a very skinny uh, a young guy wore in combat pr many times a decorated person. They may have names of their sweethearts or their moms uh, inscribed on the jacket, artwork on the back and perhaps the front. 
the patches uh, or icons that they added to the jackets. These were, you know, unique individuals. This wasn't just some f nameless, faceless mass mass of of soldiers. These were individual airmen with individual personal interests, passions, and fears. Many times illustrated on their jackets, um, the the jackets that may have the bomb symbols painted on it. That that was that was a countdown to safety. You know, once they, they got their 25 bombs painted on the jacket, th th they could escape the horrors of uh, the European air war and go somewhere safer, go back to a training base in the U.S. or get a desk job uh, at a base. So the, the, those, those tick marks are not s just marks of pride, but a countdown to escape, to safety, to be able to maybe go home to their girlfriends, their wives, their moms, their dads, their siblings, uh, or their children uh, back home. So to watch visitors look at these jackets and watch that story sink in is, for me, very profound. The other uh, really profound thing, we, we get a lot of families who are coming to the museum that knew that their grandpa, their dad, their uncle, um, some relative. Yeah, it was in the Air Force during World War II. I think he was in England. And, and we can look up that information in the lobby. And if they were th with the 390th, we can direct them to the photo of their uncle, their dad, their grandpa, their crew photo on the wall. And... <clears throat> to watch the uh, emotional reactions. Mm -hmm. This may be the first time they saw their, a photo of their, their dad or their grandpa when he was 19. Mm -hmm. you know, dad was just this middle-aged guy that you know, told them when to be home for supper and made sure they did their homework. And now they're seeing them, uh, you know, maybe 17, 18, 19, with these other guys proudly uh, in their flight suits, uh, maybe by the aircraft they were assigned to. And uh, a lot of them start crying. It, yeah, I, I, I can totally, I can totally see that. And, and how, how reward, I don't know if rewarding is the right way, humbling that must be for, for, for you as the museum director to be able to, enable that yes. connection must be something. Is my experience prior to coming to this museum at uh, observatories and NASA museums, so much of that was <clears throat> displaying either exploration technology, mm -hmm. and, and te the telescopes are, are a form of exploration technology, rocket ships, uh, robotic space probes, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and such, um, or presenting really big concepts of space and time and distance and the power of black holes or the possibility of life on other worlds. These are not personal mm -hmm. concepts that, that people have an emotional reaction to other than maybe, wow, yeah. right? Here, we're, we're showing something much more intimate, much more human, much more emotional. We... Um, we are talking about life and death and suffering, as well as success, victory, if you will, the uh, emotions of finally being able to go home, mm -hmm. having survived, survivor's guilt, because maybe you survived it, the rest of your crew, crew did not. So you see a lot more um, emotion, yeah. emotional reaction of our visitors, even among kids. Because when mom and dad start to cry, the kids might too. And, and it's not that we're a sad museum. I don't want to <laughs> uh, no, 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 get no. the message across <laughs> to your listeners that come to our museum and you're going to go home a mess. Not at all. It's just that our our museum has a much more intimate, much more human. We are much more about the human story of the 390th than 
bombs and bullets and and radial engines and propellers and and so forth. Our mission is to remember, to honor the courage and sacrifice and the success of everyone who served in the 390th. That's what we're about. We're about the the people of the 390th in this period, this unique period of world history. And what they did, what they accomplished, what they went through, their homecomings, uh, how they went on to build a successful country uh, afterwards, to build functioning families, to put their, you know, create kids and put their kids through school and to, to live to retirement and such. That's what we're about. We're not about the, the technology. Yes, we, we show the technology because these were tools uh, the, from airplanes to throat microphones uh, used to communicate or flare guns to communicate between planes, uh, first aid kits, boots and gloves that kept them alive at 30,000 feet in the uh, stratosphere. Yes, we, we, we present some of that technology, we, we showcase some of it, but it, it's ultimately about the human story. The best museums, you know, as a plane geek, I've been to a few, um, and you, you, you tend to go and you, you look at the stuff and you, you have your favorites. And the thing I always say to people I'm with is it's an inanimate pile of steel and aluminum. Yep. It's not a thing until people get in it. And I think, you know, we've, we've mentioned this many times and I'm gonna mention it again. The way the museum is here, you very quickly forget about the tech. You very quickly start thinking about the young men and it's, a, it's beautifully done. And I don't mean that in a manipulative sort of way. It, mm -hmm. it's, done, it's done right. And I Thank think you. it's, you know, e even for a lot of the exhibits around here as well, you're drawn away to the people's stories, even though you're surrounded by a lot. But there you have that sort of compression, you pop out from the, the entrance hall, you see the aircraft, and then very quickly you see the people. Yes. And it's, it's, it is something. And in the coming months, you'll see a lot more people stories featured as we um, start uh, setting up new exhibits that will feature, for example, an uh, exhibit that, cross our fingers, might come online tomorrow, uh, is a complete set of flight clothing on a mannequin from literally the underwear on. They wore this uh, blue colored cotton underwear, uh, blue bunny suit is what it became <laughs> nicknamed as, but it's long johns, uh, everything from ankle to wrist. Uh, piece of, wrapped in toaster wire. Um, toaster wire sewn into the fabric of this underwear. And then the, the leather clad, sheepskin lined, uh, big bulky flight suit, the gloves, the boots, the mask, helmet, the goggles, that'll be on a mannequin on display. Um, like I said, uh, hopefully tomorrow morning. It's uh, scheduled to go into its case. Oh, hopefully tomorrow's my last day. I want to see it. <laughs> uh, I hope so. Not a, don't no, make this legally binding, but the uh, company that has the uh, case that will get inserted into the wall is supposed to arrive uh, 8.30 or so tomorrow morning. So if that if all goes according to plan, then at some point mid-morning perhaps, everything will be on display uh, in there. So if you, if you can come back for even <laughs> just five minutes, it'll be worth your while. And we'll be filling the rest of those cases uh, over the course of 2023 with a lot more personalized exhibits like that to tell. And boy, do I have plans for the uh, upstairs and, and uh, other areas of the museum during the, the, the next two, three years. You, you, you won't recognize the place. So there's one last question. Yes. And that is the Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks elephant in the room when it comes to talking about the 8th Air Force. <laughs> yes. Mass of the Air is due apparently later this year. You've got the book on in, in there as well. Mm -hmm. What, I don't want to say what impact, it hasn't been out yet, but do you, do you think that that sort of show focusing on the bloody hundredth as well. Do, do you think that might have the Band of Brothers effect where it starts focusing a lot into one specific group because people can recognize that? Sure. Or do you think it might have the broader effect of once again bringing the eighth to 
a new audience like, say, Memphis Bell did in the 90s? I, I'm really hoping that it will ultimately inspire people to learn the broader story. Uh, Masters of the Air will have a, a Band of Brothers slash Saving Private Ryan slash Memphis Bell effects on the public imagination and, and public peak the, the curiosity and interest uh, among a large segment of the population to learn more about the air war uh, in Europe. You know, the 100th Bomb Group is the focus of Masters of the Air, but never did the 100th Bomb Group fly without the 390th being alongside them and the 95th. Uh, our three bomb groups always flew their missions together. We were the three groups were organized as the 13th Combat Wing. So the 100th uh, never went where the 390th didn't go. So we were always there alongside, uh, heading to the same targets. They, were, they had their own base, 95th Bomb Group, 390th, three different bases. We formed up together over England and went into, went into uh, experience the hell of uh, air combat over Europe uh, together. So the, the stories that you will see played out in Masters of the Air on, I believe, Apple Plus TV later this year are the same stories as the guys' experience of the 390th and the 95th, and for that matter, all the other bomb groups. The names might be different, but the experiences were essentially the same. The horrors, the uh, as well as the exhilarations. Uh, yeah, you've, you've been given this, you're a pilot, you've just been promoted to pilot of a quarter million dollar uh, <laughs> piece of government machinery here. You, you have your cool leather jacket. You are, you are in charge of these other nine guys. Sure, they had exhilaration and pride and all sorts of other positive emotions that I hope will also shine through in the television series and uh, uh, we intend to also display more and more of that in our exhibits. Fantastic. Thank you so much for spending a bit of time with me. And uh, it's a really, really moving museum. Thank you so much. I, I couldn't, um, couldn't agree more. Uh, before I was hired here, uh, even while working at the observatory, the 390th Memorial Museum and, and Pima Air and Space Museum, or as my wife knows, the place I spent all my free time. So uh, when the opportunity to join the 390th team came along, oh my gosh, I, I couldn't uh, write that application letter fast <laughs> enough because I, I grew up with this as a family story. Uh, I started building B-17 models when I was seven or eight years old on through high school. So this was a story that um, I was meant to help tell and propagate in my role. Fantastic. I can't thank Bill Buckingham enough for his time and clearly his passion for the 390th Memorial Museum. I'm not blowing smoke at you, dear listener, to say that it is a very moving place. That wall of pictures, seeing all the jackets and knowing just how young the boys were that were wearing them, they're also very small as well. Even six months on, I'm still moved by the effect that the museum has. And if you're ever out there, as always go visit our wonderful sponsors at the Pima Air and Space Museum, but do not miss the 390th Memorial Museum. And if you're there on a Thursday, there'll be a gentleman by the name of Dick Bouchon sitting in a fabulous A2 underneath the B-17, and he'll answer any question you have for him just about. Actually, I'm pretty sure he would answer any question you asked him. But Dick is 100 years young, he flew 28 missions with the 390th, and he is our guest next week. And he's just fantastic. I cannot wait for you to hear that. In the meantime, thank you so much for your continued support of the pod. As always, tell your friends, share the links, let everybody know about this fantastic aviation history podcast and the wonderful 390th Memorial Museum that is on the top of your bucket list. Well, right after Pima, of course. If you fancy getting a bit more involved, as always, as a patron, you can become a damn castier from just three pounds a month plus a bit of VAT. You get these episodes early, different intro, extros, no ads, all of that good stuff, plus some bits and pieces that I've had in the works. Now that I've moved house, I might actually get around to them. You never know. 
But times are tough. I understand that. Just tell your friends, pop some stars into your app of choice. Because as we've been off for a couple of weeks, as I've been moving house, the downloads have continued. The reviews have still been coming in. You are all being incredibly generous with your praise. I can't thank you enough. And to reward you, next week you get to meet Dick Bouchon, who is, oh, he's just fabulous. Until then, do take care of yourselves. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bow and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.